Yo, this is crazy to me. Check this out. So my friend Bo came to me and started to tell me about exciting times with Bitcoin. He showed me how Bitcoin grew from 12 United States dollars a coin to over 3,000 a coin and how people like Tim Draper has made millions in the process. Immediately, I spent a few hundred dollars on Bitcoin. But wait, what the hell is Bitcoin? Ooh. Well, we have a mouthful ahead of us today because there are lots of terms, labels, and definitions, but stick with me now. We're going to do the best we can to break down exactly what is Bitcoin and how we got here today. But in order to understand what Bitcoin is, I think it's important to first dig into why Bitcoin was even created in the first place. The year is 2008 and New York City is the number one financial center or a place that is home to a lot of important financial services in the world. Fun fact, as of March 2017, the United States is no longer the financial center of the world. Despite the confusion with Brexit, it's actually London, believe it or not, followed by New York City, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Tokyo. Just a little interesting fact. Everything in the US seemed to be going business as usual when all of a sudden, pop. The housing bubble 2008 pops, causing financial markets to fall by 30% due to banks making really foolish choices behind the scenes, ranking this event as the most horrific in US financial market history. But out of this chaos, a paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto gained attention, which outlined a new cryptocurrency, or a digital currency that uses complex math to secure transactions that would take away power from the banks. The root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is a full breach of that trust. Satoshi Nakamoto. And that new cryptocurrency was called Bitcoin. I see. So Bitcoin was created to try and take power away from the banks. That's interesting, but I don't fully understand. The housing bubble of 2008 was of course bad, but it's not happening every day. How would a currency that doesn't involve the banks be better? Well, to go back to Satoshi's quote, he created Bitcoin as a solution to a problem. So in order to answer your question, we have to first understand the problem that Satoshi was trying to solve. Now, it's important that we focus on Satoshi's use of fiat currency, because there are a few important types of currencies, such as commodity currencies, or a currency that is based on raw materials, like grains, spices, livestock, metals, jewels, and things like that. There are also representative currencies, or using something that represents something else that has value, but has little to no value itself. For example, paper money, the representation that represents reclaimable gold, the commodity. The amount of paper money that exists is equal to the value of gold in all banks. Representative currencies are good because say you have one ounce of gold that's worth about 1300 US dollars. Trying to spend this one ounce of gold on goods and services like dinner, a movie, and an Uber ride would prove to be very hard. And so instead, spending one ounce of gold in a currency that represents one ounce of gold makes a lot more sense. And when you need your gold back for whatever reason, you can freely go to a bank and get whatever is left in your gold using the paper money. But but even though I am confusingly using modern cash here, if you think the money in your bank account is a representative currency for gold, boy do I have some news for you. The cash that you're currently collecting is not a representative currency. You can't walk into a bank in 2017 with your cash and ask for equal gold in return. And it's been this way since 1971 when Richard Nixon declared the US dollar no longer represented gold, putting an end to the US's use of representative currencies and turning the money that you currently use into this last type, fiat currency. Now, fiat currency is a lot like representative currencies, except it doesn't represent any commodity whatsoever. You see, fiat currency is supplied by a central power, meaning one source sets all the rules for the currency. But giving this much power to a single source is what brings us full circle to what Satoshi seen as a problem. When one source has all the monetary power, the central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is a full breach of that trust. Satoshi Nakamoto. So, to answer your question, Bitcoin as a decentralized currency means that there are little to no fees when dealing with your money, no one can hold or take your money away from you, it's hard to counterfeit, and the list goes on. But most importantly, one source can't completely destroy the value of your entire life savings. Okay, that's interesting. So Bitcoin not having to go through central banks comes with a lot of benefits. But you said that people have made millions off of Bitcoin. How does Bitcoin have real monetary value? 
Well, I think the easiest way to explain this would be for us to take a look at an analogy. Let's say you walked into a pizza joint and tried buying a pizza using the Matrix DVD box set. Obviously, you'd be looked at as a psychopath. You'd have to use something like a $20 bill instead. But with enough trial and error, I'm willing to bet that you'd find a pizza joint that'd be willing to sell you a pizza for the Matrix DVD box set, which we're gonna abbreviate as MBS to make our lives a little easier. But if they accepted payments from everyone using MBS, they'd run into some problems. First one being, can they pay goods and services using MBS? Can they pay their employees, store rent, pizza supplies, gas, electric, etc. using MBS? In theory, yeah. If say in a month's profit they made 5,000 MBS, well that directly translates into US dollars. Selling all MBS at 10 US dollars on Amazon will give them 50,000 US dollars. But of course, here we run into another problem. Are there even enough people interested in buying a total of 5,000 MBS a month? Outside of having a great trilogy to watch, why else would someone want to own MBS? Now, we're about to go a bit further off the wall, but stick with me here. But say one day someone publishes a persuasive paper on why MBS has great value. Something like, the matrix is the greatest challenge of all time. If we use it as a currency, then it could spread knowledge on simulation theory and maybe lead to the most important answers of our universe. Finn. And from that paper, millions want to own and use MBS. Well, you'd find a lot more people willing to accept your MBS for not just US dollars, but for many things like food, vehicles, yard work, you name it. Because they can trust that with these matrix box sets, there are other people who are willing to trade it for goods and services. I know this analogy sounds super off the wall and whatnot, but this is how cryptocurrencies gain value on the most basic level. The only real difference between crypto and fiat currencies is that instead of someone writing a paper or being persuasive, governments force you to choose between using their currency to pay taxes or go to jail which gives their currency a lot of value. Okay, back to the analogy. Now, this whole Matrix DVD box set was a bit of a goof, but it's not completely impossible. Take Pokemon cards, for example. What value would you say this paper card has by looking at it? $2, $5 maybe, maybe $20? Well, if I flip it around, you'll see that it's actually a first edition holographic Charizard that's actually worth a cool uh, $1,500. Why? Well, again, because people agree that's how much it's worth. Now, I want you to answer honestly. If someone wanted to employ you to mow this lawn once a week and in return they'd pay you one holographic Charizard a week, would you do it? If any of you guys answer no to that, please sign up for the next available finance class. Now, along the same lines for Bitcoin's value, Tim Draper, a billionaire venture capitalist, believes that Bitcoin will be worth $10,000 a coin by 2018. And that's what made it valuable for him. Uh, but Bitcoin, uh, I, I'm still predicting Bitcoin, $10,000 per Bitcoin in three years. Which led him to spend $19 million on 30,000 Bitcoins in 2014. Eric Finman, a young entrepreneur, believed that his friends and family knew what they're talking about with Bitcoin, and that's what made it valuable for him. And he was going on and on about this thing called Bitcoin, which he said was going to replace the dollar, it was the currency of the future, and he said he bought 40 Bitcoins. And using this, all the money that I saved up, which was about $1,000, I, I decided to shut him up and buy more Bitcoins than him. When Bitcoins were at $12 when I bought them, they rose to $1,200. And then I had a hundred bitcoins. And at first I was like, what do I do with this money? And Roger Ver, aka Bitcoin Jesus, believes that Bitcoin will help take away power from corrupt politicians. And that's what made it valuable for him, which led him to invest more than 25,000 US dollars in Bitcoin when it was worth about $1 per coin. With cryptocurrencies, its success really can be built on a structure that simple because no one can tell you what you think is and isn't valuable. No one can tell you where you can and can't invest your goods and services. The truth is, all cryptocurrencies have value simply because people agree that they do. Wow, very interesting insight. So literally anything can be worth as much as Bitcoin is currently. It's just a matter of getting a large number of people to believe and support in it. That's incredible. So I think the next logical question is, how exactly does Bitcoin work? 
Ah, yes. I thought that you'd never ask. So Bitcoin is a bit of a programming masterpiece. Reason being is because it's decentralized. Something that we've talked about a little bit, but now let's take a look at how it's decentralized. So again, a centralized currency means that there's a central power that controls the cash. Things like managing the supply, setting the rules with the currency, keeping all banks in check, things like that. And in the US, this central power is the Federal Reserve. So now a decentralized currency simply means that your money doesn't exactly follow the rules of one power, other than the limits of Bitcoin itself, which are mostly simple things like you can't spend what you don't have. But how is this possible? Who is storing the data and making sure that Bitcoin works right? Whoa, whoa, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Relax, guys, eesh. Anyways, anyone who wants to is helping to make sure Bitcoin works right. Put simply, Bitcoin is just a log with every account and balance ever. But to be exact, the log is called a ledger and the accounts are called wallets. Some people choose to help Bitcoin grow by storing this ledger on their computer. And in order to make sure that everyone in the world has the same ledger and computers don't go off making their own history of Bitcoin buys and sells. And warning, this is where it gets really, really technical. So layman's alert. But a really, really hard maths equation is made and all computers that are helping Bitcoin grow try to solve this hard equation with guesses. And yes, these equations are so hard that the only way to solve them is by guessing. By design, if a single computer were guessing by itself, it'd solve the equation every year or two. But all the computers around the world guessing together is how this decentralized power works, which allows them together to guess the answer about every 10 minutes or so. Wait, 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 hold on. Something's missing here. Running computers, it costs electricity. It generates heat, it costs wear and tear in a computer, and etc. Why do people choose to help Bitcoin grow? Guy, relax. I'm literally in the middle of explaining this. I know you're all curious and whatnot, but chill, guy. Ugh. Anyways, again, the first computer to solve this hard equation wins and gets to share their answer with every other computer in the world. And as a reward for their success, they're given some Bitcoins, which as of August 2017 is 12.5 Bitcoins per equation solved, which is worth about 50,000 US dollars. So I'm sure that lets you know why people want to help Bitcoin grow. And after all that, every computer starts the process all over again, trying to solve the next equation, which happens about every 10 minutes or so. And this is all part of the process to keep a robust decentralized system running smoothly. Huge side note, the inner workings of Bitcoin is far more complex than this, and honestly, it deserves its own half an hour of explaining. So in the description, I've left a couple of links to my favorite Bitcoin explainer videos. They are really fascinating and really good. Fascinating stuff. That's a really interesting infrastructure that Bitcoin is using. A bit much to take in, but interesting nonetheless. I guess my final question is, is Bitcoin worth it? Well, unfortunately, that question is 100% based on your own personal opinion. Only you can decide if you think Bitcoin is worth it or not. So to try and help you out, I sat down with Isabella Kaminska, a financial expert over at Financial Times, and she's been watching Bitcoin for quite some years now. Roll interview. All right, first and foremost, Isabella, thank you so much for your time. I'm very grateful, but let's get right into it. So my first question for you is, what are some of the biggest pros and cons of Bitcoin? So Bitcoin really does three things. Encrypted transactions, which the banking industry has always done, so that's nothing new. The immutable blockchain, so all the transactions are on every ledger, well distributed, you know. The banking system never did that. It didn't do that for cost reasons. You know, banks were ultimately always secret keepers, so Bitcoin does the opposite. And the third thing it does, is it polices the clearing network through the pr proof of work function. So you don't have to depend on a corporation, you depend on anyone who's incentivized to come in and offer processing power to the network to solve the kind of riddles within it, which is a part of the, how it clears the, the transactions. And that proof of work function is probably the most important thing about Bitcoin and what's most innovative about it. Um, Cons, it, it replicates the gold standard, and we have very good research and academic study has gone into why the gold standard didn't work. You know, the problem with anything that's based like, on a gold standard is that the velocity of transactions has to really go up exponentially to service the economy, and velocity is hard to dictate. You know, one of the funny things about the price going up is the more it goes up, the less it becomes a medium of exchange. Interesting. Now, one thing that I'm curious to know is 
Bitcoin is currently correlated with like some sort of dollar, usually the United States dollar. But my question is, how can Bitcoin become an independent currency? It will never service the world because it's designed to prioritize its value over its functionality. And that is a big problem for us. So what, why is the dollar of the international reserve currency? What makes it such a great currency for international trade? It's stability. It would have to be more stable. I mean, you can have price inflation, don't get me wrong, but it has to be subtle. It can't be like, oh, today a sofa is one bitcoin, tomorrow a sofa is 14 bitcoins. I mean, that's not a conducive way to run society. I see, I see, I see. All right, next question. There are some governments and whatnot that don't like Bitcoin. So my question is, how can a government or some sort of power shut down Bitcoin? There are two ways. A government can just rule explicitly that Bitcoin is a controlled substance, right? And uh, we don't tolerate it. And it can also rule it more implicitly. And the explicit route is dangerous because in a free society, it's always a bit controversial to kind of claim something is bad or erroneous or wrong. The government has been very successful at getting all the major exchanges and every conduit that gets real dollar fiat money in and out of the system has been very good at enforcing those licensing rules for money transfer businesses. It is very hard now getting money out of Bitcoin if you're not part of the official clearing network, aka if you haven't gone through regulations that govern all the app systems. And they're coming after all the exchanges that are not operating via the international rules of finance. And they've done that, I think, in a very interesting way because it's inadvertently shutting it down for basic cost function and competition rather than it being explicitly authoritarian and going, Bitcoin is bad. And that's very clever, I think, of the government. Good stuff. Isabella, once again, thank you for your time. And finally, where can people find you? So I write, obviously, for the Financial Times as a subscription service. So I have a column which would be behind the paywall for that. But um, AlphaVille, for now, I believe, is still is the registration uh, wall, but it's free still. So you can find me on the FT AlphaVille blog. It's the only part that you can still access for free. I'm on Twitter at Isa Kaminska. And yeah, just, you know, I'm always open to having, you know, fun discussions about this stuff. So if you want to reach out, please do. Huge thanks to Isabella for her time. And hey guys, real quick, that interview was kind of cut short just because this episode is already kind of long. But if you want to check out the full interview I did with Isabella, which I highly recommend because she has so much great insight on finance period, the link is at the top of the description. See you later. I hope all this info helps you make the decision whether if you think Bitcoin is worth it or not to you. Whoa, super incredible information today. And I think I get it now. Ultimately, Bitcoin, just like any new innovation, has varying value because what Bitcoin is depends on the intention of the user. Because currently, Bitcoin is many things. It's an investment, a quicker way to purchase, a more private way to purchase, a cheap way to purchase, and in cases like Venezuela, it's even a good place to store your money. But for me personally, I impulse bought some Bitcoins because I wanted to take an investment risk and maybe benefit from my decision in becoming an early adopter. And you see, at the fact that Bitcoin gave me this opportunity made Bitcoin valuable for me. And even if Bitcoin completely crashes and I wasted my time and money, that's all right, because there's a funny thing about risk. If it were guaranteed to everyone, then everyone would do it. Man, Bitcoin is such a crazy topic, but learning all that makes me feel a bit better about my impulse purchase. But today, I have one simple question for you. Are you at all interested in owning some Bitcoins? Cast your vote by clicking that question on screen. It should be in the top right corner. I am very, very curious to hear all your thoughts on this topic, so please come continue this conversation with me on Twitter, at Sefstuff is my handle. I hope that you all found something curious today about Bitcoins, but Whatever the case may be, remember to always feed your curiosity.